Good morning, good morning. If you would, open to Revelation chapter 13. Also, if you wouldn't mind sharing with your network and uh, expanding our audience. In Revelation 13, we're in our fourth part series on uh, Antichrist. Uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. Father, as we commit our hearts and minds to receive of your word, we pray that this word would go forth with clarity and understanding, rightly divided and anointed of you. We pray, Father, that by this word, by this revelation, Father, your spirit, Father, would lead us into a deeper truth and understanding of you and your word, Lord. We thank you, Father, that this would not just be a Bible study, but an encounter with you, Lord. We thank you for touching us and changing us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, Revelations chapter 13 and verse 1. It says, I stood on the sands of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So just, uh, uh, we've been at this for, for three weeks prior. So just to uh, go back through this and review, the sea means the nations coming up out of the nations. So John sees a single beast coming up out of the nations, having seven heads. And we've learned in the last weeks that these heads are nations, and these nations dominated the known world at their time in history, and that their leaders uh, were considered deity. Uh, so they were worshipped. These are a type of antichrist. So six of these have come and gone. Uh, we, we talked about them, the, the Assyrian, the Egyptian, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greeks, and the Romans have come and gone. And this seventh head is different because on the seventh head, which is antichrist, which we're waiting for, it's yet in the future, uh, it has 10 horns and 10 crowns. And we learned that these are 10 nations that sort of build the foundation of his kingdom. He will be the 11th that rises up. He'll subdue three. But these 10 are in place, which will pretty much sign their, uh, their authority over to him. In verse 2, the leopard, the bear, and the lion were, were types of, uh, from Daniel's actual vision. We looked at it. Dan, you know, leopard was the Greek empire. The bear was the Medo-Persian. The lion was the uh, Babylonian. And so Daniel had a vision about these empires as they rolled out. And then it says the, the dragon, Satan gave him, and I like to use the word investment. Satan invested his power, his throne, and authority into this seventh head, which is representative of Antichrist. So it goes verse 3. It says, I saw one of the heads as it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast saying, who is like it unto the beast? Who can make war with him? So we're, we're talking about a man now. We've sort of, he, John sees this vision of a, of, a, of a beast. He calls it an animal. He continues to call it a beast, but we're starting to now move and talk about a single man. And I want you to see a, a couple of things now as we go in verse 5, 6, and 7. Uh, it says, and he was given, and you, you, you'll see that he, the man, was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for, four, for 42 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, and he blasphemed his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him. So twice he says it was given to him. Now it says it was granted to him to make war with the saints, to overcome them, and authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, nation. Uh, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names are not have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has ear to hear, let him hear. And so there's this man. He's Antichrist, right? We've been talking about him for three weeks. We see here that he has military genius. Verse 4 says, who can make war with him? Verse 5 says he has a mouth speaking great things. So he's a great orator. 
He's a great political leader. Uh, we see that he has charisma, and all that dwell on the earth will worship him. We see that 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 he reigns for 42 months in verse 5. We learned in the past that uh, he will have the same amount of time that Jesus had on the earth. Jesus had a little over three years. Uh, 42 months is three and a half years. So uh, the seed of God had three and a half years, and the seed of Satan will have three three plus years. And so I wanted you to see that it was given to him. It was given to him. It was granted to him. He it was it was given over to him to have authority. So four or five times we see that that not only Satan empowers him, gives him great authority and strength, and all that it all that Satan has is pretty much invested in him. But we see that God allows this. I mean, God is sitting back and allows. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So at this, this last sort of 42 months of history in this dispensation, God is allowing, similar to the way he allowed Job, right? In the time of Job, he allowed Satan to, to come against him. So today I want to look at, you know, when, what are the signs? When does this happen? How does it begin? You know, where does he come from? Um, and so uh, with that, let's turn over to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. And Matthew 24, and when you're studying end times, is probably the richest, most direct text in Scripture. I mean, Daniel had visions. Um, you know, Isaiah prophesied, Ezekiel prophesied, all those prophecies. But here we have Jesus answering three questions, two of which have to do with end times. Verse 3, it says, Now he, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, his disciples. So who's he talking to? His disciples, they're alone. They're on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And that question refers to what was above in verse 1 and 2, which is the destruction of the temple at that time, which occurred in 70 A.D., Jesus doesn't answer it here. He answers it in Luke's gospel. But he asks two more questions. What will be the sign of your coming? What, what should we look for that would tell us about your second coming? And what will the end of the age or end of the world look like? So they ask him two questions that he answers here in Matthew 24. What will be the signs that we should look for that reveal your coming? And what will it be like at the end of the world? And so Jesus answers them chronologically here. He goes, then Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. So anytime Jesus gives us a warning, take heed that no one deceives you, he's really saying there's going to be a lot of opportunity to be deceived. So in other words, be warned that there's going to be a lot of deception. For many will come in my name saying, I am Christ and will deceive many. So many will come in the name of Christianity and say, I'm the anointed, and but they'll be false, and they'll deceive many. As for many, again, if you circle the word many, you'll see that it's, it's said quite a few times. Let's jump down to verse 6. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So he begins to lay out these signs. Each of these is a sign. You know, there, there, there's going to be deception. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. He tells us not to be troubled at what you read in the newspaper, what you experience, or what you have to endure. He said, because all of this must come to pass. In other words, I know about it, and it must come to pass. For nation, verse 7, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famine, pestilence, and earthquake at various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. We've taught extensively on this in the past. I mean, here he lays out this list, but verse 8 really gives us something in the human experience that allows us to understand what Jesus is talking about. He says all these are the beginning of sorrows, and it, 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 what he's saying here, actually, if you break it down in the Greek, all of these are birth pangs. And so he takes something in the human experience when a woman is pregnant and she's approaching the birth of, of her baby, she begins to get contractions, and as she gets closer to the birth, these contractions get more intense, more severe, 
and they come closer together and more regular. And so what he's saying here is wars, rumors of wars, kingdoms rising up against kingdoms, pestilence like we're in now, uh, earthquakes and famines are all going to come more frequently and more severely until I come back to the earth. And so this is a list he's telling us to look at these signs. Now, when you look at history, in the last hundred years, we've had two world wars. We, 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 you know, we did, we're suffering a global pandemic. It's not just the continent or, or a nation or a region of the world, but the entire world now is engaged in this uh, current pestilence and famines coming as a result of it. So these are signs. Verse 9 says then, and, and the way the chapter is broken up is there's four sections, and each section starts with another then. So, so he's basically saying this is the start, then you're going to see this happen. So he says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated of all nations for my namesake. So now he turns, he's talking to his disciples. So who is he referring to here? He's referring to those that are solidly engaged with following Christ, those that have given their life over and their heart over to Christ, because these are disciples. Verse 3 says he's on the Mount of Olives talking to his disciples, so it's like he's talking to us today. He said, then they will deliver you up to what? Tribulation. They'll kill you. You'll be hated of all nations for the name of Christianity. So when you look at this, he's not just talking about Christianity as a whole. He's talking about those that are really Christians, those that follow Christ, those that won't buckle under pressure, those that follow his word, that are true followers of Jesus as well as Israel. Um, both of these together converge. And so he's saying, then we're going to come into this period where you're going to be hated. Your thinking is going to be hated. The way you live is going to be hated. The way you, way you raise your kids are going to be hated because you're going to be an outcast of society. He says, and then many will be offended. Offended at what? Offended at having to walk this walk offended to, uh, to have to suffer uh, because they've never been taught. Uh, they thought that, you know, every Christian should have a four-car garage. And so they'll be offended. They'll betray one another, hate one another. So it's not betrayal of the world or other religions. Within Christianity, there's going to be tremendous infighting because of the doctrinal lines will be blurred. And there'll be those that follow the word that believe that this is God's inspired word, that it doesn't change. And then there'll be others that are migrating away from uh, the word of God in the name of tolerance. And so they'll gravitate away. So many will be offended. Uh, another time that this is used is when Jesus was arrested. All of his apostles and disciples were offended. They ran from him. Verse 11, many false prophets. Again, many false prophets will come up and deceive many. Uh, most false prophecy is about good things happening, not bad. It sells more books, right? And because lawlessness will abound. In other words, because society had uh, had decayed to such a, a place that lawlessness is abounding, right? Uh, the love of many will grow cold. So many Christians will fall by the wayside. Really, when you look at 9, 10, 11, and 12, um, what he's telling us, is that many believers, because of the pressure, because of the culture, because of the false teaching, will fall away. It's an apostasy that he's talking about. Because they'll be offended and leave. They'll be deceived away. They'll begin to live like the world and grow away. Verse 13 says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. In this gospel, the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Verse 15 is where we wanted to get to today. It says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whosoever reads, let him understand. Verse 16 starts with then, a new section. Verse 15, the abomination of desolation. What does it mean first? Abomination means evil. 
It's abominable. It's evil. It's greatly evil. And desolation means destruction. So therefore, when you see, in other words, what are the signs? When you see this great evil begin to destroy, spoken by Daniel the prophet, we'll look at it, standing in the holy place. So someone's going to stand in the holy place. That's Antichrist. It says, whoever reads, let him understand. In other words, Jesus is telling us, I want you to understand this. I want you to read it. I want you to read Daniel. And I want you to understand it and comprehend it. Verse 16, it says, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on a housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. So we see here, there's an immediate warning that when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, we're going to draw a complete picture of that today. When he stands in the holy place, verse 16, 17, and 18 gives us a tremendous sense of urgency. It's almost like a, like a dam broke. And this abomination of desolation starts rushing out, right? Whatever was holding it back starts rushing out because he says, if you're on the housetop, verse 17, which is where you would relax in the evening, you come home after a hard day's work, you wash up, you have dinner, you go on the housetop under the stars, and that's where you're relaxing. He said, don't go into your house and pack. He said, if you're in the field, verse 18, that he was in the field, not go back to pack and get his clothing, you know. And, and, and so he, verse 19 then, woe unto those that are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those, of those days. Pray that your flight not be in the winter and the Sabbath. So there's this great sense of urgency like a dam broke that if you're in Judea, which is in the Jerusalem region of Israel, immediately get out. Immediately don't pack. Immediately watch out because destruction's coming. Verse 21 tells us what, what's going to happen. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor shall ever be. Verse 21 tells us that the great tribulation begins with the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. This is called great tribulation. This is that 42-month period prior to the return of Jesus. This is like the last sign. Um, if we were doing an exhaustive study, we would see a bunch of the seals, trumpets, and, and vials in Revelation all be executed in this time period. This is when a lot of things break loose. We're going to look at several of them today. But I want you to see the immediacy of it. I want you to see because it's the unveiling of him. It's the revealing of him. It's, it's, it's the day that he gets to go from the starting line. When you look at this, the, the holy equivalent is when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. When he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended upon him, and he started in his father's anointing. He began to go out. He didn't do healings and all the other things that we see him do in the Gospels, uh, with healing the blind and raising the dead. It all started, you know, the starting gate was the anointing or baptism of the Holy Spirit when he was baptized by John. This is similar in the evil way in that when he goes in the abomination of desolation, he now has that authority that we read in Revelation 13. And we, we, we're, we, we, we're going to see that, that a lot of things are going to happen. So the sign leading up to the abomination of desolation is verse 9 to 14, where the church comes under severe persecution. We're beginning to see that in our nation today. We're beginning to see the lines drawn very clearly between us and them. We're seeing two completely points of views in our, in our land. We're seeing one that's global, giving up the country's sovereignty, trying to, you know, uh, all of the rule of law being changed, um, uh, uh, different powers being invested, you know, things that you would never think would happen, you know, uh, uh, looking back the last 20 or 30 years that are happening today. So we see this trend, and next week's message actually is on this, these trends that are leading to where we're going to end up. 
that's these signs, looking for these trends that'll bring us to that place, right? And so I want to look at the, uh, uh, domin uh, the abomination of desolation. Let's look at a New Testament passage. Go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you. So I want to set this up. We're going to read about six or seven verses. But it says, Concerning the return of Jesus and our gathering together to him. Now, uh, those of you that have been sitting under my teaching for a while, you understand that I believe that the rapture and the resurrection are one event. They happen with the return of Jesus, that the rapture is not a separate event, that we're not being out of here, escaping the trouble. I believe that we're blessed and protected in the trouble. Um, and I believe that, that we'll, we'll be greatly anointed in the trouble, in the great tribulation and the tribulation prior. But I want you to see that he's talking about the return and the gathering of the saints to him, which is the saints in heaven, the saints on earth, which we call the rapture or the resurrection. Verse 2, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by letter, as from us, as though the day of Christ has come. So Paul's writing 2 Thessalonians, the second letter to the Thessalonican church, and he's telling them, don't be shaken or troubled, as if I wrote you a letter. In other words, there were forged letters going around historically that said Christ came and you guys missed it, which, you know, is, is an odd thing by itself. Remember, this is written in the first century. They didn't have everything that we have looking back. And so Paul's writing to straighten it out. So verse 3, which is important to our message today, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come. What day will not come? Our coming, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the second coming, and our gathering together. So that day won't come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So the coming of the Lord and the rapture, and the resurrection will not come until the falling away happens and Antichrist is revealed. So those two things have to, have, have to happen first. Verse 3, the word falling away is the word apostasia in the Greek. It's apostate. There's going to be a great apostasy out of the church. While I believe there's going to be a great revival at the end and many people coming in, there are also going to be a lot of people going out. And so he says here, he uses the word apostasia. Um, other teachers have tried to make this the rapture of the church. You know, the leaving or the capturing away or the plucking up of people, as we see in the other sections of scripture that talk about the rapture, uh, use those words, catching away, right? This says apostasia. So look for a great apostasia, which I believe is happening right now. You're seeing whole denominations in the church turning from the word and moving into tolerance and social uh, structures, which are against the word of God. And so that happens, and then the, the Antichrist is revealed. So let me read it again. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless there's a falling away first, the apostasy, and the man of sin, Antichrist, is revealed, the son of perdition, Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, that's uh, capital G, our God, that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. So here's the abomination of desolation. Uh, he goes into the temple. Now the temple's not built, so this isn't going to happen next week. So he goes into the temple, and he goes into the place where God's presence would be, which is the holy place, and then he proclaims himself to be God, and he actually sets up an image there, 
so that anybody going to that temple sees an image of him as a type of deity. And so this is the abomination of desolation. So when you're looking at the signs, which we'll look at next week, the temple isn't built. It's, it's pretty much right now, with barring a war or some great peace plan, uh, I don't see them building the temple. So, you know, when we start to see the construction of the temple, very similar to one of the signs we're going to talk about next week about Israel becoming a nation, then we know there's a possibility of his return, that we're getting closer to it. But the abomination of desolation is him going into the temple and proclaiming himself to be God in that place. This was written in the first century. At that time, the temple's there. We know the temple's going to be destroyed in 70 AD, right? And so there's, there's the new building of the temple that has to happen next. Uh, let's go over to Ezekiel 28. We looked at this last week. Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. And verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God. Now, we, we studied this, actually, I think two of the weeks. Um, verse 11, the king of Tyre is, of Tyre is Satan. And so here it's the prince, his son. And so it says, because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am God, and I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas or nations, yet you are a man and not God. Though you set your heart as the heart of God, behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There's no secret that can be hid from you. With your wisdom and understanding, you've gained great riches. We looked at this last week, great wealth. You've gathered gold and silver into your treasury. By great wisdom in trade, you have increased your riches, and your heart is lifted up because you are rich. Thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of God. So one, two, three, four, four times here in five verses. We see him saying, the Bible saying, you sit where God sits, you think you're God, you desire worship from people as if you're God, you've gotten great wealth and great riches, and because of Satan's empowerment and investment in you, you've become quite uh, a man charismatically, the world thinks you're the greatest, you understand secret, Daniel uh, was very wise, verse 3 says, behold, you're wiser than Daniel. Daniel prophesied about all the kingdoms before they came into existence. He said, you're wiser than him. And so he goes on to, to, to say how he's going to take them down. We might as well read it. Uh, verse 7, behold, there I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of nations. They will draw their sword against the beauty of your wisdom, defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit. You shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the nations or the seas. Will you still say before him who slays you, will you say before Jesus when he comes to slay you that I'm a God? Are you going to be that daring to say that? But you shall be a man and not a God. In the hand of him, Jesus, who slays you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised or literally the unsaved by the hand of the aliens. For I have spoken it, says the Lord your God. And so we see here that, that Ezekiel prophesied about this man, Antichrist, going into the temple as God. Let's go over to Daniel and see it. Go over to Daniel chapter 11. <clears throat> Daniel 11, in verse 31, it says, and, and forces shall be mustered by him, Antichrist. They shall defile the sanctuary fortress, that's the temple, then they shall take away the daily sacrifice and place there the abomination of desolation. So not only does he go in to uh, the holiest of holies, but they set up an image there of the abomination of desolation, which is him. <laughs> you know, uh, in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar set up an image of himself that when you see it in the music played, you had to worship it. 
We see in the last century Adolf Hitler and his regime, whenever anybody greeted anyone, they greeted in the name of Hitler, Heil Hitler. It's a form of worship. They put Hitler above everything else. And so uh, uh, he was worshiped. So the Bible says here that he's going to take away the daily sacrifice. So we're going back to daily sacrifice in the new temple, and they'll set up an image. Those who do wickedly against the covenant, for he antichrist, he antichrist, will corrupt with flattery. So we learned last week that he actually comes in peace. The first seal is, a, is him on a white horse riding with a bow with no arrows. So he comes in peace. He comes here in flattery. He, he says, but, but, and here it says, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. So the people that know God will not be persuaded away by the wealth, the answering of questions, the great inventions, the answering of age-old questions, the ability to bring peace on the earth, the ability to make sense of things, and anything he touches prospers. So they won't be, they won't be taken or drink the Kool-Aid, if you will, by him. They'll be strong and they'll carry out exploits. Verse 33 says, and those are the people who understand, they'll instruct many. Because of their understanding, they'll instruct many. Um, when you look at this, there's no chapter and verse. So we're, look, we're talking about this time of Antichrist. You go down to verse chapter 12 and verse 1. It says, and at that time shall Michael, the archangel, shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at the, that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who's, who's uh, found in the, in, the, in the book. And so here, you know, we see three, you know, four different variations. So here's what he's going to do. He, he's going to consolidate his power early. We're going to look now at tribulation period. In fact, turn over to Daniel 9. We're going to look now at the timing of this. We're going to look at the seven-year period. We're going to look at possibly where he comes from. But what I want you to see before we move on is the abomination of desolation is this man uh, growing in, in stature with such a global image prior to the abomination where he obtains huge amounts of wealth, answers questions that can never be answered, uh, comes up with solutions to problems that plague humanity, uh, probably bring peace in the Middle East, right? Uh, he may, he may not. We don't know how, you know, when you study end times, here's the best way to describe it. We know all the pieces, right? We, we know uh, that they come together to make the final picture. We just don't know how they sequence. We don't know exactly how they sequence. We see enough to know what's going on. So if you're on earth and you see the abomination of desolation, you know things are going to get very bad for the earth. You know that you're going to need God's protection and that you're going to need to be fully invested in God. You know you're going to know, need to know God, right? You don't, you're not, you don't get a chance to just learn about him in these three and a half years. If you're part of that generation, you have to have all of this in your heart already. That's why I'm such a stickler on how churches should be teaching this every year. Every year, because one generation has to teach the next generation. It can't be a lost teaching. I mean, the roadmap on what's going to happen was given to us for a purpose. When we see one seal open, we know what's coming. We know what the next seal says. We know what the next trumpet says. That's why we should study this and make it a part of our heart. What does is, what is learning end times do? It teaches us that we love and serve a God who knows the end before it happens. He writes history before it even occurs. He knows the end from the beginning. That same God said, I'll love you, and I'll never leave you or forsake you. And so we need to understand that some of these things will be called to endure. I mean, I've had people tell me, you know, uh, that God's going to rapture everybody out because he would never put his bride through tribulation. 
And I tell them, just read what happened to the apostles. Beheaded, filleted, sawed in half. I mean, uh, you know, did he not love them? Uh, we're, we're called to serve a God. And part of our service is standing out and believing an unseen God by doing things that most human beings would not do because they're tied to the physical circumstances. We see a God where we will walk into fire, will walk into death, will accept what's done to us because we love him and know him. We will not cower. We will not deny him. You have to be trained in that. I have to be trained in that. You don't just learn that. You grow into it. It's a, it's a growing. And so God, you know, tests your metal. He tests your strength as you go through life so that you're prepared and you can stand. Amen. So now go to Daniel uh, chapter 9. This is, these are some of the most important uh, revelations concerning end times. Uh, so let's look at verse 24, Daniel 9, 24. It says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to, for the reconciliation of iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up or complete the vision and prophecies, and to anoint the most holy. So he, he gives a list here. He says 70 weeks. You need to know what that is. At the end of 70 weeks, there'll be no more sin. There'll be no more prophecy to fulfill. There'll be everlasting righteousness. And all uh, reconciling of iniquity will be accomplished and will finish the transgression against God and humanity. Well, that's a big, bold statement. So let's, let me break this down for you. If I told you a dozen, you would immediately think of 12. The word weeks here means the same thing. It means a group of seven. So it's like saying a dozen means 12. The word here, and I think in the Greek it's heptomad, but it's, it's 70 groups of seven are what? Determined for your people, the Jews, and for the holy city, Jerusalem. So to try and understand that, let's go over the same chapter. Let's just go to verse 1, Daniel 9, 1. It says, in the first year of Darius, the son of Hasaras, of the lineage of the Medes, he's a Persian, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through the, through the prophet Jeremiah that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make a request by prayer and supplication and fasting. So let me, let me explain this because it's, it's fascinating. So here we have Daniel saying he's in captivity. He's in the 70 years of captivity. The Babylonians took them over, destroyed the temple, destroyed the city, brought them to Babylon. <clears throat> they became slaves. Daniel and his uh, Adrach, Meshach, and Abednego became eunuchs. And so 70 years, Jeremiah said, you're going to be in desolation for 70 years. So he knows he's coming to the end. We have to understand what does the 70 years represent? The 70 years represents 70 Sabbath years that Israel did not have a Sabbath year. So the, God told them to have six years of seed time and harvest so they would plant for six years and reap for six years. In the sixth year, they get a double harvest. In the seventh year, they were to let the land rest. They weren't to farm that year. Right? So for 70 Sabbath years, they did not let the land rest. So 70 Sabbath years is 490 years. 70 times seven years. 490 years. So for 490 years, they skipped this seventh year. So God, wanting his way, 
took them out of the land, brought them to Babylon. They were imprisoned. And what happened? The land rested for the 70 years that they missed. So uh, by not doing or obeying the word, a generation went into captivity for 70 years. The city was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. So we're looking at a 490-year section of time. Okay? Same chapter. So God tells him, right? Uh, God uh, speaks, or I think it's Gabriel speaking to him. He says 70 weeks, so 70 groups of seven. I'll tell you it's another 490 years. So 490 years are determined for your people and for the holy city. And here's what's going to happen after 490 years. We're going to finish transgression. So all of the transgression against God, his word, and his people are going to end. There's going to be end of sin. Sin is going to cease. We're going to reconcile for iniquity. All of payments in the books will be settled and judgment will be done. We're going to bring in everlasting righteousness, right, standing with God. We're going to seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. So all of the vision and prophecy contained in Scripture is going to be done at the end of 490 years. And then Jesus is going to take his position. So that sounds great, except this happened already, right? So we have to look at it. So verse 25 says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the walls even in troublous times. So now he's, he's telling him, Daniel, I want you to understand <clears throat> that from the going forth of the commandment, picture God having a stop clock. When the commandment goes, and Nehemiah lived with that, King Artaxerxes gave the command to build the city and the temple. God started a clock, a stop clock, and he broke it into two pieces. One is seven weeks, which is 49 years, and it took them five decades to rebuild the city because of the trouble. So that first seven, seven, uh, 49 year period for seven weeks happened. If you look at the end of verse 25, the street shall be built again and the walls even in troublous times. So let's look at the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. There's a decree to rebuild it. It'll be rebuilt again. This is the temple that Jesus walked in. This is the temple that we see him in. Okay, This temple will be destroyed again in 70 AD. But that seven-week period brought us 49 years. Then he says in 62 weeks. Well, look at verse 25 again. Know therefore and understand. In other words, Daniel, I want you to know, readers, today's Bible study, I want you to know, and from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until Jesus comes. So he's speaking 400 years before Jesus comes. He's saying Messiah is going to come and, and he's going to build, uh, uh, come after 62 weeks. So here, let me go through this again. I'm confusing you. So there's a seven week, week period and then there's a 62 week period. So verse 26 says, after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So 49 years, they rebuild the city and the temple. 62 uh, 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 weeks, or uh, 400, uh, 434 years, right? So 49 and 434 years comes out to 483 years. We're missing one week. So that's 69 weeks, right? Seven and 62. So he says, after the 62 weeks, Jesus will be killed. Remember the wise men that came to see Jesus? They came from Daniel's teaching. They were magi under Daniel's teaching. That's how they knew the timing. So, and I have a study on this. I, I don't know if it's in our YouTube lineup or not, but, I, but it's certainly in, uh, don't get this wrong, our series that I'll tell you about at the end. So he's basically telling them, after 483 years, when Nehemiah gives the commandment, Jesus is going to be crucified, 
right? And here's what he says. And after 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. That's for us. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end it shall be with a flood until the end of the wars, desolations are determined. So he's saying here that after Messiah is cut off, after this, you know, 483 years, that the city and the sanctuary and the temple will be destroyed again. That happened in, in 70 AD, 40 years. Jesus was crucified and died in about 30 AD. He was 33 years old. He was born before BC. That's a whole different teaching. But he, he, so he dies in around 30 AD. 40 years later, that, that temple that was built in the city was destroyed again. And then all the way from 70 AD until May 14th of 1948, Israel was not a nation. They had dispersed the Jews throughout the world. And it's a miracle. But on May 14th, 1948, the United States was the first country to recognize Israel as a nation, Harry Truman. And in 1967, uh, they took back uh, Jerusalem. In fact, they completely controlled Israel. Uh, it was through the through the Jews and their their ability to allow other faiths to prosper because they owned the Temple Mount. They could have done anything they wanted. They could have bulldozed the Dome of the Rock, but they didn't because as a culture, they're a very free society. They're very similar to us where you're able to worship whoever you want to worship, right? And so... At the end, the people, verse 26, in the people of the prince who is to come. Okay, take a look at that. The people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So who destroyed the city and the sanctuary? And who's the prince? The prince is Antichrist. The people who destroyed the temple were the Romans in 70 AD. So... Rome or Europe and parts of Asia will be a part of the Antichrist kingdom. So there are outposts in Turkey, in Syria, and, and, and Greece. When Rome controlled the world, there were outposts. The Romans, so let me read this amplified in what we know today. So after 62 weeks or 483 years, Jesus will be uh, crucified and die. And the people of Antichrist, who is to come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, the Romans. In the end, it's like a flood until the end of what the war and desolations are determined on Jerusalem. Verse 27 now is the only time we hear about a seven-year tribulation period. And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Okay, so he is Antichrist, the prince who is to come. He'll sign a covenant with many for one seven-year period of time. So now when you're looking at God's clock, he started it with the commandment to build the temple. He stopped it at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus in the church age, which was a mystery. It starts again for seven years when a covenant is signed with many for one seven-year period. He's going to be one of many that signed this. It's probably going to be a global agreement. And in the middle of the week, in other words, in, in, in the middle or, or halfway through, which is three and a half years, in the middle of the week, he'll bring an end to the sacrifice and offerings. And on the wings of abominations, the one who makes it desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. So in the middle of the week, he's going to he's going to stop, completely stop the sacrifice. This is the abomination of desolation. So what do we see here? We see that that God stopped the clock. All of these trends are moving in place. At some point, the temple's going to be built. 
at some point, there's going to be a sacrificial system, ceremonial system set up, going back to Old Testament days. Because remember, the Jews uh, don't believe Jesus was the Messiah. So as a part of this agreement, which I believe encompasses many things around the earth, I believe that as a part of this agreement, um, the sacrificial system for the Jews will be able to go back and process. And I believe that, uh, that uh, in the middle of that week, Antichrist will break this covenant and begin to do things on his own. So we need the temple to be built, right? We need the world moving together. We need Jerusalem to become more and more of an international city, right? It's becoming uh, now the capital of Israel. I believe that that's going to intensify. I believe the United Nations may move there. I mean, many things are going to fall in place in this next uh, five or six years, especially with Trump at the helm. Uh, Trump can actually put in place the, the, the agreement. It doesn't say that Antichrist builds that agreement. It says that he'll sign the agreement, right? He'll be one of many that signs the agreement. And so there's a lot of things that happen now in Great Tribulation. I don't have time. we got about eight minutes left. I don't have time to go through uh, this, um, uh, all of the teachings. But, but number one, Antichrist is empowered. Authority is given to him for 42 months. He's given into the saints are given into his hands. Two, Revelation chapter 12, Satan is cut in, is cut out of heaven and is thrown into the earth. And so uh, uh, in, in Revelation chapter 12, there's war in heaven with Michael. Satan's cast out of the upper heaven, and he is now cast to the earth, and he can't leave the earth. So the Bible says that his wrath, his anger is there. So you have Antichrist. And now you have Satan in a whole different, uh, almost like trapped in a cage on the earth, wreaking havoc all over the earth. You have two Old Testament prophets in Revelation chapter 11, which, uh, which come on the scene and are, uh, are preaching and a nemesis to, uh, to Antichrist. You have angelic passiveness in Daniel chapter 12. We read it where he... Uh, 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 Aunt Michael, which stands for your people, stands idle. It's like he folds his arms and says, I, I'm, I'm idle. And that's why we see this big rush to get out of Judea. And so there's all these signs. And here's what I can tell you. I've been studying this for 40 years. I've been teaching it for almost 30. Guys, I, what, I'm, what I'm reading in the paper and what I'm seeing happening is amazing to me as the trends go. I mean, we all think we have it figured out. The trends keep continuing. I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to know and wise enough to know now not to guess at things. I mean, we love to speculate. It's going to happen the way it's going to happen. We just know that it does happen. And we know that, it, that, that in its happening, these are the things that are going to happen. And so, you know, when it comes to studying the word, it's vital that we understand this. It's vital that we understand because I look at it like, uh, and, and it, we really see it in this crisis situation, um, the best way to gain control and for people to give up their rights is a good crisis. 9-11, you know, three planes were, four planes were hijacked. And two went into the World Trade Center, one went into the Pentagon, one uh, crashed in, in Pennsylvania. After that, just about all of us, uh, said, I don't care what you have to do, strip search, check, you know, uh, invade our privacy. We don't want to get on a plane with one of these guys again. And so we, what did we do? We gave up our rights. You know, in 2008, during the last Great Recession, we gave up rights again. And, and now in this crisis, just think about what the government is doing to us. It's not, I, I don't look at it as evil, right? But what it's taught and what it's done is all of us are willing to compromise what we're doing and how we're doing it for the greater good or peace or safety. I mean, if they told us we want everyone vaccinated and everyone that has had COVID to take an ID card so that we know who's coming in and out of the country, we know who's, who's, who's 
uh, vaccinated, who's not, to get into events, who's going to say no? You know, so it's just what? One step closer to the mark of the beast. And so we need to teach this. We need to get a good understanding of it. We need to uh, continue to learn about it. Um, in closing, you know, I have this series. Uh, don't get this wrong. You know, we have a couple thousand of these. Uh, if you want one, just email us your address. Just an address. You don't have to send us a name. It'll either be mailed to you uh, or uh, someone will leave it on your front porch. Uh, they won't knock or ring a doorbell or interact with you at all. It's just either our, my, my family or uh, volunteers will leave this. Last week, I think we gave out about 30 uh, of different series. Please, please uh, order this. It's free. Uh, we'll send it to you. We'll mail it to you. You can download it on our website, watchersoftruth.com. It's an awful big file. Uh, you can you can download a, a session at a time and a workbook uh, a chapter at a time. But it's DVDs. There's 12 hours of teaching and a workbook. We have two other series, uh, Are You Sure in Understanding Jesus? Also, if you have prayer requests, please uh, write us at... at uh, contact at watchersoftruth.com. Tell us a prayer request. Tell us, you know, what you need. Uh, we'll join with you in prayer. If you need me and the team to call you, we will. Uh, we'll join together in prayer for you. Um, if you need counseling, uh, please call us. Please interact with your church. Also, we're looking for support. Uh, if you would, please support us. Become a partner with us, maybe a monthly partner. You can go to watchersoftruth.com. There's a giving section on our site. Our ministry is to teach like we are uh, and to produce curriculums that bring sound doctrine and understanding to various subjects. We ask you to become a partner with us, join with us in our effort to educate and bring knowledge and revelation. Uh, in doing that, uh, I'll see you Tuesday night. Uh, next week, we'll take up the, the fifth installment of Antichrist. We're going to look at the signs, the trends seeing the trends uh, digitally, physically in society, world, countries. I mean, what's happening with China now is a trend. It's a sign. Um, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. Lord, I just give you glory and praise and honor that you, a God who knows the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end, chose to give us wisdom, revelation, and knowledge concerning your word, Father, in the days that are ahead having a roadmap for yet what's ahead of us. I thank you for it, Lord. I thank you that your spirit would give us a zeal, a great desire uh, to understand your word, to understand these truths, Lord, that we would not buy into the deception, but we would be strong because knowledge brings strength, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the doors that you've opened for our ministry to teach and to preach and to share. Father, not in a building, but in houses and homes and living rooms and kitchens, Lord, bedrooms. Lord, I thank you, Father, for those listening. I pray a special prayer, Father, that they would, Father, not only walk in peace and safety and protection and that no plague would come nigh their dwelling, Lord, but I pray, God, for spiritual sensitivity to your voice. Lord, I pray it all the time for those that, that join with us in ministry, our partners and those. Lord, I pray that we be sensitive to your leading and guiding, your directing. How you teach us and lead us, God, is through your word, both written but also spoken. I pray for a new sensitivity for all of us, me included, that we would hear you, Lord. We would hear your leading and your guiding. Your word says, my sheep know my voice. I pray, Lord, that we distinctly know your voice. And, Father, that we follow not deception, not the enemy, not only, not only our, not even our own ambitions, but your true word leading us and guiding us. We give you praise and glory and honor. Lord, we pray for those that give into our ministry, that support us. We pray that they share in the fruit, Father, of every heart and change and move. We pray for a hundredfold return, Lord. We pray for blessing upon blessing, Father, to those. We pray that you continue to give to your church and support your church in this time of great darkness and pestilence. Lord, we give you glory and praise and honor. We love you so much. We thank you. Father, we just give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. May God's face shine upon you. May you walk in all the blessings that God has for you. 
Have a great weekend and I'll see you Tuesday night.